Sound familiar? <laughs> did you know that we Americans have about three times the amount of space we did 50 years ago? Three times. So you'd think with all this extra space, we'd have plenty of room for all our stuff, right? Nope. <laughs> There's a new industry in town, a $22 billion, 2.2 billion square foot industry, that of personal storage. So we've got triple the space, but we've become such good shoppers that we need even more space. So where does this lead? Lots of credit card debt, huge environmental footprints, and perhaps not coincidentally, our happiness levels flatline over the same 50 years. So I want to suggest that less stuff and less space are going to equal a smaller footprint. It's actually a great way to save you some money and it's going to give you a little more ease in your life. It's a story about us, people, being persuaded to spend money we don't have on things we don't need, to create impressions that won't last on people we don't care about. What is the objective? What is the objective of the consumer? Mary Douglas asked in an essay on poverty, written 35 years ago. It is, she said, um, to help create the social world and find a credible place in it. Now, that is a, a deeply humanizing vision of our lives, and it's a completely different vision than the one that lies at the heart of this economic model. So who are we? Who are these people? Are we these novelty-seeking, hedonistic, selfish individuals or might we actually occasionally be something like the selfless altruist depicted in Rembrandt's lovely, lovely sketch here? Well, psychology actually says there is a tension, a tension between self-regarding behaviors and other-regarding behaviors. And these tensions have deep evolutionary roots. So selfish behavior is adaptive in certain circumstances, fight or flight, but other-regarding behaviors are essential to our evolution as social beings. And perhaps even more interesting from our point of view, another tension between novelty-seeking behaviors and tradition or conservation. Novelty is adaptive when things are changing and you need to adapt yourself. Tradition is essential to lay down the stability to raise families and form cohesive social groups. Unfortunately, while this society is without a doubt the most prosperous and dynamic the world has ever created, it's got some major, major flaws. One of them is that every society has an ecological footprint. It has an amount of impact on the planet that's measurable. How much stuff goes through your life? How much waste is left behind you? And we, at the moment, in our society, have a really dramatically unsustainable level of this. We're using up about five planets. Um, if, if everybody on the planet lived the way we did, we'd need between five, six, seven, some people even say ten planets to make it. Clearly, we don't have ten planets. Again, you know, mental, visual, ten planets, one planet, ten planets, one planet, right? Um, we don't have that. So that's one problem. The second problem is that the planet that we have is being used in wildly unfair ways. Have you ever wondered where all the stuff we buy comes from and where it goes when we throw it out? I couldn't stop wondering about that, so I looked it up. And what the textbook said is that stuff moves through a system from extraction to production to distribution to consumption to disposal. All together, it's called the materials economy. Well, I looked into it a little bit more. In fact, I spent 10 years traveling the world, tracking where our stuff comes from and where it goes. And you know what I found out? That is not the whole story. There is a lot missing from this explanation. For one thing, this system looks like it's fine. No problem. But the truth is, it's a system in crisis. And the reason it's a system in crisis is it's a linear system and we live on a finite planet. And you cannot run a linear system on a finite planet indefinitely. Every step along the way, this system is interacting with the real world. In real life, it's not happening on a blank white page. It's interacting with societies, cultures, economies, the environment. And all along the way, it's bumping up against limits. Limits we don't see here because the diagram is incomplete. So let's go back through. Let's fill in some of the blanks and see what's missing. Well, one of the most important things that's missing is people. Yes, people. People live and work all along this system. 
We'll start with extraction, which is a fancy word for natural resource exploitation, which is a fancy word for trashing the planet. What this looks like is we chop down the trees, we blow up mountains to get the metals inside, we use up all the water, and we wipe out the animals. So here, we are running up against our first limit. We are running out of resources. We are using too much stuff. Next, the materials move to production. And what happens there is we use energy to mix toxic chemicals in with the natural resources to make toxic contaminated products. And of course, the people who bear the biggest brunt of these toxic chemicals are the factory workers. So you see, it's not just resources that are wasted along this system, but people too. Whole communities get wasted. So what happens after all these natural resources are turned into products? Well, it moves here for distribution. The goal here is to keep the prices down, keep the people buying, and keep the inventory moving. We shop and shop and shop, keep the materials flowing, and flow they do. Guess what percentage of total materials flow through this system is still in product or use six months after their date of sale in North America? 50%? 20? No. One percent. One. In other words, 99% of the stuff we harvest, mine, process, transport, 99% of the stuff we run through this system is trashed within six months. So in the end, what happens to all the stuff we buy anyway? At this rate of consumption, it can't fit into our houses, even though the average house size has doubled in this country since the 1970s. It all goes out in the garbage. And that brings us to disposal. All of this garbage either gets dumped in a landfill, which is just a big hole in the ground, or if you're really unlucky, first it's burned in an incinerator and then dumped in the landfill. Either way, they both pollute the air, land, water, and don't forget, change the climate. What about recycling? Does recycling help? Yes, recycling helps. Recycling reduces the garbage at this end and it reduces the pressure to mine and harvest new stuff at this end. Yes, 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 we should all recycle, but recycling is not enough. Recycling will never be enough. It's not, it's not just about products in people's homes. We've got to think about the raw materials that produce our products. Obviously, there's fantastic opportunities with recycled materials and we can and will go zero waste and there's opportunities in a circular economy, but we're still dependent on natural raw materials. Let's take cotton. Cotton's brilliant. Probably many people are wearing cotton right now. It's a brilliant textile in use. It's really dirty in production. It uses lots of pesticides, lots of fertilizer, lots of water. So we've worked with others, with other businesses and NGOs, on the Better Cotton Initiative, working right back down to the farm, and there you can halve the amount of water and half the chemical inputs. The yields increase. And 60% of the costs of running many of these farms with farmers with low incomes can be chemical inputs. Yields increase and you halve the input costs. Farmers are coming out of poverty. They, they love it. Already hundreds of thousands of farmers have been reached. And now we've got 60% better cotton in our business. Again, we're going all in. By 2015, we'll be 100% better cotton. Take the topic of 100% targets, actually. People sometimes think that 100% is going to be hard, and we've had the conversation in the business. Actually, you found 100% is easier to do than 90% or 50%. If you have a 90% target, everyone in the business finds a reason to be in the 10%. Uh, when it's 100%, it's kind of clear. You know? And business people like clarity, because then you just get the job done. And I think everybody would agree that now business has to take full responsibility for the impacts of your supply chain. Many businesses now, fortunately, have code of conducts and audit their supply chains, but not every business, far from it. And this came in IKEA, actually, in the 90s. We found there was a risk of child labor in the supply chain, and people in the business were shocked. You know? And it was clearly totally unacceptable. So then you have to act. So a code of conduct was developed, and now we have 80 auditors out in the world every day, making sure all our factories secure good working conditions and protect human rights and make sure there is no child labor. But it's not just as simple as making sure there's no child labor. You've got to say, that's, that's not enough today. I think we'd all agree that children are the most important people in the world and the most vulnerable. So what can a business do today to actually use your total value chain to support a better quality of life and protect child rights? We've worked with UNICEF and Save the Children on developing some new business principles with child, children's rights. Increasing numbers of businesses are signing up to these, but actually in a, in a survey, many business leaders said they thought their business had nothing to do with children. Um, so 
what we've decided to do is we will look and ask ourselves the tough questions with partners who know more than us. What can we do to go beyond our business to help improve the lives of children?